Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. I'm Richard Walensky. This is KPFA's Bay Area Theater podcast, featuring stage reviews along with extended versions of interviews heard on Arts Waves on Cover to Cover. My guest is Joy Carlin, who has directed a play, Widower's Houses by George Bernard Shaw, at the Aurora Theater through March 4th. That's in Berkeley. Joy Carlin is an actor, Blue Jasmine, several television films, occasional guest appearances on TV shows. Over the past few years, you've become a director, which we'll talk about, and also was the um, interim artistic director at Berkeley Rep and was the associate artistic (laughs) director over at ACT. But first, before we go into a little bit about your career, I want to talk about widowers' houses. I was saying before we went on the air that I was with a friend of mine who knows a lot about plays. This is a George Bernard Shaw play he'd never heard heard of. That's right. Every time I mentioned to someone I was doing this play, they said, really? I've never heard of that one. Well, I was in that play in 1952 in Chicago, my first theater company, and Sartorius was played by Ed Asner, who was a member of my company, which started at the University of Chicago. And, you know, we were kids. Of course, he was playing character, older parts from a very young age. Of course, I've heard of it. Aurora Theater did the play some years ago at the Berkeley City Club before they moved into their wonderful new theater. It happens to be Shaw's first produced play. When I went to Wikipedia, it said it was originally co-written, but the other person dropped out? Well, that was William Archer, who was quite a famous theater theoretician, And he started to co-write it because Shaw felt he needed some guidance since he'd never really written a play that was going to be produced yet. Also, I must mention that Shaw was influenced and sort of spurred into writing this play because he heard a lecture in London by an American economist named Henry George. And I have this information from a very nice person who wrote me a note about it when it was announced we were going to do this play. And he said, I think you should know this. And I found it really, really interesting. He gave this lecture in London that Shaw happened to go into and listen to. It was about, of all things, income inequality. This inspired him because Shaw, looking around him and saw the conditions of some people, the way they lived, the slums in London, and he decided that was really an important issue and he should write about it. And he thought the best way to get around to many people was to do a play. Well, if he wanted to write a play, it had to have some social significance. And indeed, this play does, and it rings true today. I had thought, not knowing Shaw's history, that he must have started young, but he was already, he, 1895, he, he, he was, was already in his like 40, late he was 40s. 40. Right, that's right. So he started late. Yeah, and he wrote 68 plays <laughs> <laughs> after that. <laughs> and many of them, like Widower's Houses, deal, well, they all deal with social issues so, yeah. on one level but or But there another. are four that he calls the plays unpleasant, and this is the first one. They are actually about social issues. This is Warren's professions about prostitution, and the philanderer is about philandering. (laughs) And um, I think Major Barber is the other one about the arms industry and big capitalists. Of course, that's another topic, but that's such a wonderful play. But that man, like Sartorius in this play, He has several sides. He's not just a horrible criminal. That's one of the elements where Widower's Houses crosses paths with Major Barbara in that the argument by the villain is 
really powerful. Yeah. It's really powerful. It's almost as if he sat down and said, what is the best argument I can come up with? And then he leaves it to the audience to decide. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure that's such a good argument that he gives. He says it's useless to give the poor decent conditions because they don't know how to live in them. Did Tom Ross choose to do the play, or did you approach um, him? Or I'll tell you something interesting. I just love the Berkeley audience. It's incredible. We've been getting a lot of letters at the Aurora to please bring back the classics, so many of the classics that I'm very used to loving and doing and having large casses, being a member of the company at ACT for 25 years, is there are a lot of people in them, and we can't do a play with more than six people. So in this play, I've got six actors, and one actor plays two roles, and that's necessary. But here's a play that they had done before. I always loved doing this play, and I thought it was very timely. I don't remember, really, whether Tom <laughs> suggested it or I did, but we both agreed it is a classic, and it has fewer characters than most, and let's do it again because uh, people don't even remember that it was done then. Well, we still have a few. After 25 years, we still have quite a few people who are still alive who uh, were subscribers back then. One of the elements of it, of course, is that because it's so rarely produced, this is one of the few chances anybody will get to see this early Shaw That's play. Right. That's and true. And this political play about homelessness and the poor. Yep. As a director, when you're looking at a play from 1895, as opposed to, say, Tally's Folly, are you looking at directing it in any different way? Are there certain keys to directing yeah. one? Well, this play... I was talking to my cast about this because, like every play, we start rehearsals talking about the characters, the depth of their all kinds of things about their education, their point of view, and so on, their psychological you know, problems. But at a certain point of the, of the rehearsals, I... I had to give a little talk about this play is not a naturalistic play. And, of course, I look at it as being on the Geary stage. That's, you know, a good place for this play. We don't have a, a stage like that. But we have to present it in a different way. And, and it is a kind of style of playing, which is a little over the top and a little bigger than a naturalistic play, like a Clifford Odette's play. Was there, at the time, I mean, this was the kind of play they did, I guess, or? or Not really. At, at, no? No. In London, the plays were all these uh, salon plays, you know, with the maid comes out and says, you know, gives gives the, the background of the play. Oh, no, madam isn't home. She went shopping. You know, her husband died three years ago. You know, I mean, these were boulevard plays, and he hated those plays. They were useless to him. And that's why Ibsen impressed him so much when they were first seeing the Ibsen plays around this time. He thought, if I'm going to write a play, that's the way I'm going to write a play, with a purpose. Joy Carlin, when you're walking into it and talking to these actors and saying, well, this is stylized, what does that mean in terms of their performance and how you're guiding them? Well, basically, they have to be truthful to their character and to uh, whatever they're trying to achieve in the play. But everyone has to hear all these words because they're very important and they don't get thrown away. And, of course, in this play, every character is so... Well, you know his stage directions. There's so much there for actors to to go on, you know, that that's actable, let's say. I don't have the script with me, but the way Michael Sullivan, who plays cocaine, and by the way, their names are very interesting. <laughs> we were really talking a lot about his name because this was also the time where Freud discovered cocaine and was using it recreationally, you know, just to feel good. 
and he's a guy who smooths everything over. To him, everything is tact. Everything has to be proper. He's he's upwardly mobile. He's he wants to climb in the society. By the way, so is Sartorius for his daughter. He wants her to marry Dr. Trench because he has royalty in his family. He wants her to be treated that way, even though he himself, I don't want to give things away, but he, you know, he, he was very poor as a young man. The name Sartorius. Sartorius, up- right. And Blanche is white, right? Something blah. She's very feisty. And by the way, she that was quite a sensation, that character, a woman who behaved that way, who beats up her maid, you know, and who is so rude and awful. So you know at the end, at least, I wanted to bring that out, that Trench is not going to have a happy life ahead of him. And that's his punishment for capitulating, in my opinion. Before we go into some of the other details... Just give a brief summary of how the play opens. What are people going to see when they walk in? They're going to see an outdoor cafe with a huge projection of a place called Ramagan, which is where the steamer that all of the characters here have been riding on up the Rhine on a vacation, on a, a summer vacation in Europe. And Blanche and her father are there because he wants her to see Europe to give her a fine education. Dr. Trench is there with his friend, Cocaine, who seems to be, we had a lot of talk about who is Cocaine and why is he accompanying Dr. Trench, a young man who just finished medical school, and he's having a little fling, a little vacation. And he met a, a young woman on the boat, and somehow they fell madly in love and uh, arranged to meet at Ramagan. And that's where they are. They're in an outdoor cafe. And, of course, it turns out that the meeting was not as accidental as we that's thought right. it would be. Since you're dealing with these long speeches and lines that could be conceived of as didactic, how do you as a director ensure that we as an audience will be entertained Mm -hmm. as well as informed? Well, that wasn't much of a problem in this play, except in the third act when the actors are telling you what this new business deal is. At first, when I had a few people watch the play, it was very important to me, did they understand what this deal is, what this business, how are they going to make money this way? It's kind of complicated, but when it come right down to it, and the way we explained it to ourselves is very simple, it's urban renewal. They get secret, someone, I'm not going to give it away, gives secret information that the city, and this is not in the play, but this is in our research, the, the city is going to tear down some of these horrible, horrible slums and build some decent housing because the London City Council was just being devised then at that time, and they had some social conscience, which was, by the way, inspired by what was going on in Paris earlier, where they tore down these horrible slums. And Hausmann, if you've been to Paris, you know the Champs-Élysées just got these gorgeous apartment buildings all along for miles. And that area was a horrible slum area at one time. So they were getting a bit of social conscience. Someone had some secret information about that and therefore was able to talk some of these slum landlords into improving some of their buildings because then they would be worth more money when the city came or other other entrepreneurs came to tear down those buildings because they had to be paid to do that. They had to, the owners of the buildings had to be paid. That's what this argument is about. In order to build a mint, in order to make a boulevard go through that area, And that's in the script, and we tried really hard to make that clear. Even if you don't pick up all of that, of course, is that they're doing some kind of dirty dealing involving real estate. It's like if you have secret information about the stock market, and you're not supposed to have that. What company is going to be inventing a new 
medicine or something. You can make a lot of money that way. Was there anything in directing the play that you saw that you hadn't seen in the earlier plays? I asked Albert Takazakis, I don't know if you remember him, he was a terrific director around here. He died some years ago. He was great with the classics. I asked him, what's the secret of playing Shaw? And he said, breath control. And I gave that tip to my actors because the sentences are long, but they do make great sense. We did some pruning in the play, you know, within big speeches, just for clarity, really. A difference, I don't know. I mean, I love directing Shaw because it's just so rich and there's a lot of subtext, even though the characters have sort of strange and identifiable names, but it's great. At the tail end of the play, without saying what it is, there's a silent... Yeah, that's mine. I'm sorry (laughs) to say that's my little uh, contribution. Joy Carlin, let's talk a little about your career. Now, you've said many times that when you were 13 years old, you got the acting bug from Mm. playing the witch in Hansel and Gretel, wound up in Chicago, wound up at Yale Drama School. Not only was Ed Asner there in Chicago, but Nichols and May were there as well. Yes, they were. Mike was a really good friend of mine. And yes, it all started at the University of Chicago with (laughs) Paul Sills, you know, whose mother wrote Improvisation for the Theater, wonderful man, and he happened, this was total coincidence, but he happened to be a classmate of my husband's at a a progressive school on the north side of Chicago. But anyway, Paul started this theater at the University of Chicago when I went there, which it was a great place. I went after two years of high school, as many kids did, and it was a very prescribed liberal arts program. So there was no drama department. There was no football. You know, it was all academic. It was great. We had wonderful teachers. One day, I saw a sign on the tree or somewhere saying, "Uh, I'm starting a theater. Come to Mandel Hall at 8 o'clock, you know. So I thought, oh, that, that sounds, I'd like that, if I can take the time to do it. And I did. And in that group was... Paul and Ed Asner and Mike Nichols and not Elaine. Elaine was hung around there. She was not matriculating, I don't think, but she was auditing classes. She was pretty smart to begin with. Paul, always carrying his mother's book around in his arms for exercises, and the way we began work on any play was to do theater games, and that spun off into after hours going over to Jimmy's Tavern on 57th Street and doing improv for people, and that became the second city. Were you there when Elaine May and Mike Nichols first began doing their little things together? Of course. It started at Jimmy's Tavern on 57th Street. Then I went to Yale in between, and then uh, after two years at Yale, Paul called me and said, well, come back, we're starting a theater. It was called the Playwrights Theater, and all those people were in it. And I did. I came back, and that's when it, where I did, among other things, Widower's Houses. And that was quite successful, and it was sort of the first little theater in Chicago. At the time, it was about 1953. Was it ever in the back of your mind looking at these people going, you know, they're all going to be famous no. I mean, when, when, <laughs> when Nichols really. and May began doing their, uh, their nightclub yeah. shtick. But before Nichols and May spun off from the Second City, which right. played on Broadway, I was the understudy, and I happened to be able to go on twice. Uh, that's how I got my equity card. I was living in New York at the time. Jeff Sweet wrote a nice book about the Second City. He's the historian of the... T- Mike was in that, Alan Arkin, and Barbara Harris, and Mina Kolb, and I was their understudy. They didn't have to bring someone from Chicago, because I happened to be living there. I was studying with Lee Strasberg, and so did Mike, by the way. So anyway, there's so many things in between. It's a big history. (laughs) Right. Then you came to California. Yes, we came to California. We had been living in New York. I was married and had three children. My husband came to teach at the university. We arrived in 1963, 64, that 
winter, the Actors' Workshop, which I had heard of, had just left. They went to Lincoln Center to be destroyed there. The critics killed them, and the whole thing fell apart. And I'd heard such wonderful things about them. So there was nothing here. There was no professional theater here. So I taught at UC Berkeley for five years, uh, waiting for ACT to come to town. But when they came to town, I was able to get in there early on. You know, teaching in the drama department, teaching acting at Berkeley, UC Berkeley, Michael Leibert, who started the Berkeley Rep, and John Lyon, who started the Magic Theater, graduated, just graduated the year I arrived, and started those two theaters. So, of course, I knew about it, and I was in a few plays, but not, but actually only after I joined ACT in 67. That's when I quit my job at the <laughs> university, and I was there for a long time. And that's really where I started to direct a lot. Student plays at Student first, Student plays, right? yeah, and then moving on. When you began directing plays, in your mind, did you see yourself as an actor, a director? How did I you... saw and still do see myself as an actor, director. I'm going to act one more time, which I think is maybe crazy, but I'm going to play Marjorie Prime in, in the spring at um, Marin Theater. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. There's a film of that with Laura Smith know. in the role. I know. Fortunately, it hasn't come here. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't until we do our show. In terms of directing, the acting, I'm sure, allows you inside the heads. Absolutely. <clears throat> yes, I think it helps a lot. Tally's Folly, I think that was might have been the first play in that little room. Yeah, uh, it was about the f- first or second, I yeah. think. Yeah. Working in that kind of intimate setting yeah. in a two-person play, yeah, I know. are your thought processes any different in working in that kind of intimate setting well, versus working on uh, larger stages? Oh, not really. The big difference would be working on a thrust like Aurora versus Proscenium. Yeah, that's a big difference. Well, the biggest difference is you can have more people. Uh, I miss that. 15 people on the stage or, you know, some actors playing extras or, you know, that's a, that's a kind of fun. When I was looking around the internet, I found an interesting quote from you <laughs> from a few years ago. In my mind, when we lost the repertory system, we lost everything. That's a little extreme, but I feel very strongly about that. I can't imagine how wonderful it was uh, acting with people you've acted with before. Now, we have a kind of a big pool here of actors, and um, I'm trying to think if in my play right now, some of them are new to me. I've never worked with Megan before. I have directed David Keith. I've worked on some of Michael's plays, and I've worked with Sarah before. I've been trying to get Dan to do a play play, as he calls it, uh, for quite a while. I don't know why. I just, there was something about him. I thought he would be so good at several things that I've directed, and he's always turned me down. But this time he accepted, and he's just been great. He's done some plays before, which I have never seen, but I've certainly seen all of his solo work, and I love it. Well, I've been talking about repertoire. Yeah. You, you have no idea what it's like, first of all, to revive a play. Uh, to bring back, uh, which we used to do a, a lot, almost every season, we'd revive something from the previous season. And also to have long re- rehearsal periods, to know the actors really well that you're working with. It, it gives a kind of intimacy that the audience definitely recognizes. One thing you mentioned is, you know, that it's almost a larger semi repertory company in the Bay yeah, Area. That's true. Because you do see people like... Jimmy Carpenter. and right. Yeah, that's right. You love to work with these people and the people they work with. You know, it's true. Yeah. But we, we get a lot of good new, new people, too. We try to find them. I go to m- almost everything I can just to see people's work for future, you know, to see if I could ever use them. And that's really important. You have to stay current with uh, what's going on. I, I saw the Ubuntu show the other night, 
I do know Ocon. I don't remember her first name. I think I worked with her in a, a reading, or, and she's excellent. But this woman, uh, Lisa Ramirez, was wonderful, Blanche. She was wonderful. And that was a, you know, it's a difficult, where they did that production. It was like in a closet, you know, with oh. literally with things hanging from the that, strings. That... <laughs> Well, that brings to mind something else. Um, last year, there was a very different kind of production of um, Glass Menagerie over at Cal Shakes. Did, are you aware of that? Yes. Yeah. Different line readings, African-American cast. Yes. The focus was on a black family moving out of the South to Missouri rather than, say, queer theory yeah. or whatever that might have been yeah. in the original I work. I, I, I didn't like that production, but it had nothing to do with any of those things that you mentioned. I just think, I mean, you could have a black, you could do that uh, if it was well done. But uh, it was just sort of not thought through or something. And to have Sean San Jose running around the audience, I, that, that made no sense at all to me. <laughs> So you don't have a problem with making the kinds of changes to transform a play, which is... No, as long as uh, you're really faithful to the play and you bring out what... Hey, look, I mean, when I direct something, I try to bring out what the playwright had in mind. Of course, I push it a little bit in this play because it's uh, such a contemporary issue that but to push what's already there is not so bad as to impose something that uh, you know uh, makes no sense. I, I don't get that. Getting back to focusing on the actors, for you, Joy Carlin, when you're directing, what exactly does that mean? What are you looking at, do you think, in a way mm -hmm. that's different from, say, a director who's never acted? Or your own focus. Yeah. I ask sometimes my actors, I ask them, is that logical? Does that make sense, what you're saying? And, and is it true? I mean, is that, do you really believe that? Yeah, I mean, things like that. <laughs> uh, I think that's important. I, I think so. I mean, the truth, you know, everybody talks about truth yet, but there, there are different truths for different people. That's all right, but... In the context of the play, does does this make sense? Is it true and logical? I, things like that bother me. If something happens, even physically on the stage, you know, if some prop is brought on or something, it doesn't make sense. What's it doing there? I don't know. You know, I ask those questions. Joy Carlin, uh, you worked on Blue Jasmine with Woody Allen, mm. and now, of course, we have the various... Me Too movements, and somehow Woody Allen has been brought in for yeah. various reasons. As somebody who goes back a long time and has lived in the, yeah. the theater world. Yeah. Everybody hugs everybody in the theater and kisses everybody in the theater. It's, it's a very friendly place. I have never, uh, you know, maybe I was just not that attractive to anybody, but I, I have never felt exploited that way at all. And, of course, if things like that went on, we always knew about it, and it was usually not just, you know, grabbing a breast or doing something idiotic like that, but, you know, people had affairs, and that was, in a way, accepted. People got divorced, married some some friend's husband. You know, you know I mean, it's that just happens. But I, I'm just amazed at all of these things that have come out. I grew up with three big brothers. They put me off of men so much, boys, when I was a kid, that I never had a date till I was about 19. I, I mean, I, they, they told, here's my favorite, my brother told me, yeah, look, this was, you know, in the 50s, don't stand in front of a jukebox without your slip on. You get the jukebox, you get the period and everything, you know. And I didn't even know what he was talking about, you know. But anyway, I have two sons. Don't their mothers teach them how to behave? I don't, I don't get it, you know what I mean? I don't understand that. 
You said you're working on Marjorie Prime from Marin Theater Company. Mm. Do you have any directing gigs lined up after this one? I don't. One other question. All of these various movies and TV gigs, what would happen? You'd be working on something, you'd get a phone call from your agent saying, do you want to do such and such? You know, the actors are very, very poorly paid in the main, and there is an equity rule that I think is a good one. You can break a contract for a more remunerative income. Well, this just happened the other night. The night before I saw this excellent production of Red Speedo in Walnut Creek, Gabe Marin is in it, and he's one of my favorite actors. He moved to New York, and of course he gets sent back here to do plays. But anyway, who was it? Oh gosh, he's a lovely actor. He plays one of the four roles in this play. He suddenly got a national commercial. And he said, oh, I, I'll be back in time. Well, we know that, you know, anyone who's worked in film knows that they don't care about plays and they'll keep you as long as they want. And, of course, he didn't come back. And so Michael Butler had to go on, the director and the artistic director, and he did with a script. And, we, you know, we were talking about it after the show last night. But anyway, good for him. You know, the audience accepted it, and that's, that happens. Yeah, we don't get that much commercial work here. Uh, there, isn't, there used to be, and if there isn't a, a series filming here, as there have been in the past, uh, then it's really hard to, to get some work that helps, helps you live here in the Bay Area. It's very difficult. Well, I've talked to actors who have said basically that their TV work, when I talked to Judith Ivey, the TV work, can't really talk too much about it because most of it is basically day job. Yes, it is. We've been handling that for years here, so it's, it's not part so, of the system. Yeah, yeah. Thinking back on the plays that you've directed, which was your favorite? Oh dear, that's hard to say. It's easier to pick the ones I've acted in. I mean, there's certain memories I have of certain roles I played at ACT. The what? House of Blue Leaves. I just remember House of Blue. The House of Blue Leaves was a favorite. Um, I don't know. There have been so many. It's really hard to pick. And directing, I don't know. I enjoy directing a lot. I couldn't. I, it's like naming your favorite child, you know. <laughs> I, I can't do that either. Is there any role that you would like to play? No. No? <laughs> no? No. I said that last time I, that this was going to be my last. I played um, uh, Meg in uh, at, at Marin about five years ago, the beauty queen. And I love doing that, but it's too hard for me to memorize all that stuff, all those lines. Widower's Houses by George Bernard Shaw. It is at Aurora Theater Company through March 4th. And for more information, you can go to auroratheater.org. And Joy Carlin will be coming up later in the spring as the lead, one of the leads of Marjorie Prime at Marin Theater Company.